So I'm Ben Sandfelder. I'm an indie game developer who specializes in tabletop role-playing games and tabletop role-playing game spin-offs. But don't worry, this lesson will be applicable to digital gaming as well. Actually, I think most of the examples in the presentation are going to be digital games. And thanks for having me back at Siege. I'm so glad people like my dice presentation. But uh, let's talk about character roles next. So first, does everyone remember Carsonization from... I think it was 2020 or so. Uh, so carcinization is the tendency of animals that are not crabs to evolve into more crab-like forms. And the reason I bring it up is because chances are in games you've probably seen the classic warrior wizard rogue trio in a game, right? Uh, feels like just about every fantasy RPG has these three classes. Sometimes they've got different names. Sometimes they're in space. Sometimes they're Pokemon. But the main thing I'm going to be talking about in this presentation is why so many games come back to those three fundamental archetypes. First, before I jump into that, I've got to back up and do a little bit of very basic game design info, right? So imagine that there's a game where all you have to do to win is press a button. Not very engaging, right? Okay, well, what if we had a time limit to that game? Now there's a conflict. Now there's a way to lose the game. What if we add a second button? Now there's strategy involved. If this button extends your time limit, do you just alternate pushing the two buttons? Do you push the time limit button and then see how many times you can push the win button before your time runs out? You have to think about it. Just about every game can be broken down into these two fundamental variables. Winning the game and not losing the game. Because there is a difference between those two things. You know, you can think of them as offense and defense. Or health and damage. So, if our game only has these two variables, then there's pretty much four things we can do with them. Winning interactions bring the game closer to ending. Not losing interactions prolong the game so that you have more time to turn the tables and win. So, if our only two variables here are health, you know, not losing the game, and damage, winning the game, then there's four things we can do. We can increase our damage, or we can increase our health or we can decrease an opponent's health, or we can decrease an opponent's damage. And that's kind of hard to say, so let's just give these four basic actions four names. We'll call increasing our damage control. We'll call increasing our health recovering. We'll call decreasing the opponent's health an attack. And we'll call decreasing our opponent's damage defense. Now. Just about every game you can imagine has these four actions in some way. I almost had a really long-winded example about chess. You can apply this to sports. Uh, but just for the sake of a quick example, I'm going to apply it to a first-person shooter. Let's look at the whole Halo franchise, right? You increase your damage. You control the situation by finding a power weapon or a vehicle. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so these things are key to the strategy of controlling a map in Halo. You use power weapons and vehicles to clear off objectives so your teammates can actually win the game. In a pure deathmatch, better weapons and vehicles help you get more kills faster. And ultimately, that's how you win the game, playing the objective. You know, if it's a deathmatch thing, you're killing enemies. If it's King of the Hill, you're getting on the hill. Now, in most first-person shooters, characters can regenerate health. That's a recovery action, but to do that, you have to back up and get to safety. In that case, you're prolonging the game and conserving your team's resources. You're not wasting time trying to respawn, and you're not feeding the enemy kills either. You're helping your team win by conserving resources. The last one, defense, is mitigating the enemy's offense. If you're in your base with a shotgun, camping the flag, you're not helping your team win, but you are keeping them from losing. 
And that's a critical action to winning the game long term. So, now we're going to pivot a little bit and talk about role playing games. If anyone in the audience is already playing role playing games, particularly MMOs, then maybe these four actions are starting to sound familiar. But first, let's talk about Dungeons and Dragons, right? So, this is the original 1997 basic D&D, the sort of repackaged, re-released version of the original rules. So, in basic D&D, there were only four classes, aside from the not-human ones. Clerics healed allies, they got rid of afflictions, and they created resources like light, food, and water. That all sounds like recovery, right? Magic users had stuff that let the party deal with encounters quickly and in different ways. They could wipe out clouds or crowds of weak enemies with a fireball or a sleep spell. They could seal doors with a wizard lock or block hallways with a web. They could fly over or teleport past obstacles. That all sounds like ways to maximize the damage the other party members are doing. If there aren't a whole bunch of weak enemies, then all your fighters can focus on the boss. So your thief characters sneak around obstacles and open locks, but their main thing is being able to backstab enemies, right? That's extra damage. It's getting rid of enemies faster. And then your fighter characters have more health and better defenses than everyone else. They might be able to dish out damage, but they're better used defending everyone else in the group so that they can do their jobs. Is this starting to sound familiar yet? It's Final Fantasy. You know, and it's every MMO ever as well. You've got your four characters, your healer, your wizard blowing stuff up, your backstabbing rogue, and your tanky fighter. Like I said, a lot of games, especially games derived from D&D, tend to have these four roles in these, way, in these four ways, but these four actions appear in every game ever, pretty much. Now, another example, you know, they show up in Battlefield as well, and they work a little bit differently, but it's the same four characters, right? So, let's back up and pause for a second. I said I was going to tell you about why every game uses three classes, but I definitely just explained four classes. So, how do we get back down to three? And how come some games have like 12 classes? What's the, what's the thing there? Why is that happening? Let's get into that a little bit, right? That first game I was talking about at the beginning only had two interactions the win button and the not lose button, right? Most games are more complicated than that. You've got things like movement, range, and as you start adding variables like that to a game, there become more ways to distinguish the classes you put in your game. Final Fantasy's Red Mage is a really good example of this. Uh, they're not as powerful as a Black Mage or a White Mage, but they can use spells from both of those other classes. They're trading specialization for versatility. So, what we're getting at here is that a more complex game has more variables and thus more ways to fill those four basic roles that I just explained. League of Legends actually distinguishes six roles instead of four. And each of those six roles has an even more defined subcategory. Like, you're not just a DPS character. Are you a skirmisher or an assassin? Are you a melee damage character or a ranged damage character? Do you only deal damage to one target, or do you blow up large areas of the map? Once we get to that kind of complexity, we're starting to shift away from what your class does to how your class does it. And that ultimately winds up being the core question of designing a class in a game. What is the player doing? How is the player doing it? Let's take a look at Overwatch's Hero Gallery, right? I know Overwatch 2 just came out. And Overwatch divides all of its heroes into three classes, tank, support, and damage. And there are 17 different damage characters 
but it doesn't ever really feel redundant because every single one of those characters has a different toolkit and does damage in a different way. So what does that mean? That means classes can do the same role in different ways. Now, sometimes with hero-based games like Overwatch or Smash Bros, you wind up with a little bit of a dilemma. Man, I really like this character. I love their story. I love their aesthetic. But wow, I cannot stand their playstyle. Their playstyle is terrible. And then some players are like, man, I love playing a healer, but this character has the most annoying voice, and I don't like the way they look. Ugh. Can't do it. So it's this dilemma where the kind of character the player wants to play does not necessarily align with the kind of things the player wants to be doing in that game. So, sometimes when players can create their own characters or have some kind of degree of customization, they can sidestep some of these restrictions. I'm going to go back to Battlefield for a minute because this one is a really good example. So at a glance, those four roles I outlined seem pretty straightforward. You've got your defensive support character. The engineer controls the map by blowing things up. The recon class is your damage dealer, and assault is your healer. So, at the surface, yes, that is how that works, but every class is a little bit more customizable than that. The support class can also drop ammo boxes. Wait, that sounds like more of a healer kind of thing, right? The engineer class can actually ride around in a tank. So how can they not be the tank class? And if I don't like sniping, I can give my sniper a shotgun instead and have them just drop spawn points? Well, that sounds like controlling the map and dealing damage. So none of these classes are really quite as clear-cut as that first glance makes them seem. All of them can be customized and fine-tuned to fill multiple roles in the game based on the player's preference. So classes can fill multiple roles, too. You don't just have to have the damage class or the healer class. You can separate the art from the design and build your classes around specific themes instead. If any class can, feel, can fill any mechanical role in the game, then players have the freedom to play the one that they'll enjoy the most. Guild Wars 2 is probably one of my favorite examples of this style of class design. Any class can fill any role, but every class does each role in a different way. For example, let's say you want to play a healer. Rangers heal by creating areas that heal allies over time. Guardian characters heal by converting negative status effects into positive ones. And then the necromancer character transfers negative effects from allies to themselves, and then from themselves to enemies. All three of those classes are filling the role of healer, but every single one of them is doing it in a slightly different way. So I've just bombarded you all with a ridiculous amount of information, so let's do just a little bit of a recap real quick. One class can fill multiple roles in a game. Classes can do the same role in different ways. And the fundamental question we're looking at when we design classes is what is the player doing and how is the player doing it? Well, if we follow all three of those rules, you know, if every class can do every role and they just do them in slightly different ways, then it sounds like maybe we don't need as many classes, right? We can boil it back down to just three really well-designed classes. And each of those classes can be designed around a consistent theme. And since the player can fine-tune the class to work the way they want, each class winds up being very customizable too. And the thing is, if we as the designers just take a very simple kind of rock, paper, scissors approach to balancing the classes, then the balance itself doesn't become that hard to worry about either. And that, ultimately, is how we get back down to three classes in our games. 
And an example of all of these concepts being used in a really clean way, in my opinion, is actually Destiny 2. So, at a glance, it's the familiar wizard fighter rogue trio. In the game, the roles feel a lot less clear-cut like that. Everyone in the game is running around with a gun, right? So anyone can contribute to the party's damage output. It's a first-person shooter. Anyone can heal just by backing off away from the fight for a few seconds, and anyone can revive allies. Having a dedicated healer class would be completely redundant, so they don't need a fourth class in this game. On top of that, you only really need healers for the hardest endgame challenges anyways, and when you need a healer, there are specific builds that let players do that if that's the role they enjoy playing. What really distinguishes the classes are their abilities. Bungie designed the how of each class around a core fantasy of verbs. Verbs like amplify, weaken, scorch, or punch. It's almost impossible to make a bad build in Destiny, but with the right combinations of abilities, upgrades, and gear, any class can be built to play the role you enjoy playing the most. So, there are a couple of reasons why the three-class thing just works, and I already touched on a few of them. Like I said, it's a lot more straightforward to balance, because you only have three classes to worry about. And since all of them can fill any role, you never have to worry about the player being stuck in a situation where there's a problem they can't solve. Second, it gives the player a range of options, but not an overwhelming number of options. In a single-player game, three classes is asking for three playthroughs, which is not a huge ask from a player. Imagine if there were 12 classes instead. That feels like a lot more work, right? You're probably going to skip a few of those playthroughs. Finally, in a multiplayer kind of environment, teams of two to six players have a lot of room for interesting decisions around team compositions if there are only three classes. If it's four players, which class do you double up on? If it's six classes, do you have two of each, or do you just go four, tank to, four tanks, one of the other two classes? Like I said, a lot of interesting compositions there. So, as far as there was so much stuff I wanted to fit in this presentation, I probably could have done like a full two-hour workshop on this if Andrew let me, but the, that would have been way too long for this. As far as things you can look into if you have more questions about this, uh, some of the sources I've touched on for this and some of the things that have really helped me kind of learn this was first look for these four fundamental actions, recovery, control, attack, and defense. Try to find them in other genres, like strategy games, board games, card games. You can even apply these concepts to sports. Look at early tabletop and computer RPGs and see how they influenced each other. See how these classes and roles evolved into their current forms over time. Compare those classes and roles with how they evolved in MMOs. MMOs, especially World of Warcraft, really codified these four roles in a multiplayer environment. D&D 4th Edition was not super popular among D&D players because they described it as too video gamey. But for us, that's a good thing. D&D 4th Edition built these roles into its core rules, and it has some of the best explanations of these concepts of any game that I've ever seen. Finally, look at how the last decade of RPGs have shifted away from role-centric classes towards theme-centric playbooks. Instead of being built around mechanical purposes, these classes are given tools to incite or resolve narrative complications. And especially as a tabletop RPG guy, I think that's a really new and different kind of approach to take. But yeah, so that is my class on classes. A lot of info at once. I definitely wanted to save some time for Q&A. So I hope everyone enjoyed it. Looking forward to hearing what kind of questions you have. All right, yeah, we definitely have a lot of comments in chat, as well as a discussion about when we're going to schedule that two-hour workshop on this topic. Oh, no, all right. So apparently we're going to have some folks who will be talking to you about it at Siege uh, tomorrow on how to do it. You'll be there, right, Ben? 
Uh, that's the plan, yeah. I'm hoping to be able to swim by around lunchtime and hang out for a few hours. All right, well, Kenji Shiguma, you know, make closer to me. Kenji Shiguma on YouTube has made a few comments um, regarding uh, the implementation of this specifically. Whoa, hey, my chat just went scrolling way away from me. Thank you, oh. Restream Chat. Uh, I separate the roles and classes to the what and how, respectively. Then you can make combinations of these. Uh, you have two sets of stats and classes. You can have primary and secondary classifications. Uh, yeah. So that plays into the any class can fill any role kind of thing. Sorry, was there more to the question? Or Yeah, yeah, you know. I definitely wanted your feedback on that look okay. at it. Um, yeah, and so a lot of games will kind of, okay, well, maybe you can only do two out of three rolls or you know two out of four rolls instead. Uh, because ultimately, when you get into class and secondary class, you end up you know, trading specialization for versatility a lot of the time. Mass Effect's class system is a really good example of this. You have the combat class, the tech class, and the biotic class. And then the other three classes are just hybrid classes that combine two of those original three. Excellent. And in Fading Suns, of course, we cheat this. That the classes are officially those who trade, those who pray, and those who rule. So merchants, priests, and nobles. And then within each of those classes, you can get all of the different support, healer, tank, DPS, etc. As yeah, you so I, I desire. Think. A lot of games usually divide support between the other three classes because uh, not a lot of players, like, love the players who can be a dedicated healer, but not every player enjoys being a dedicated healer. Right, right. Uh, and yeah, usually the healers in um, Fading Thuns will also have the better mystic perception abilities and things like that. And it is interesting that our support class really is the engineers who are engineers with their cyber enhancements to create all sorts of bizarre things. So it is interesting how you can implement these mm -hmm. to fit the actual flavor of your game. And I think that's one of the things you touched on very nicely is how the yeah. kind of atmosphere the game is trying to set helps define how they define classes. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of a really good example for that one. Uh, Mork Borg is a tabletop RPG, uh, but the classes aren't, you know, you're not just a fighter, you're a fanged deserter. You know, they're, they've got a whole lot of theme and character and background built into the class, and that was a really fun approach. Cave Geek has an interesting comment. I always like Shadowrun because it was classless, it archetypes as flavor, but you mm -hmm. create absolutely anything you want. But of course, Shadowrun then had that serious problem that different archetypes would disappear from the party and were not good party. For instance, the hackers, if the yeah. hackers were doing things, everybody else sat around and did nothing. And yes. if the major uh, shamans were an astral, they, everyone else did nothing. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, so... Games where any character, so the games where you build your own class, in those kinds of systems, it is even more important for the any class can fill any role kind of thing, because typically the more freedom you have to build your class and your toolkit from scratch, the more character creation pitfalls there are in your game. Unless you have really finessed the balance, it becomes really easy to pick sort of, you know, their nickname sort of trap options and end up with a character who might have the feel you want but is mechanically not viable in the game. I actually wound up, funny you mention it, in Shadowrun falling into that trap too because um, I wanted to play a rigor character so I made my highest priority in character creation money. Money was my superpower which meant none of my stats were good enough to actually do any of the you know, stuff I needed to do. Right, and I think that's one of the great things about this presentation, Ben, is you're focusing on multiplayer and how all of these help make a better party and a group experience. And yes. uh, some of this is less applicable in single player where a character needs to do everything and potions provide a lot of mm -hmm. things that other classes would do. Yeah, I, I wanted to touch on Skyrim a little bit because, you know, 
in Skyrim, yeah, you can build a dedicated healer kind of character, but you don't really need to because unless you have you know party members with you, you don't really if all you do is stand there and heal, you're not you know fighting the boss. You know you can stand there and do your recovery thing, but um, you're not winning the game. So you need other things in your toolkit. And as a result, most single player games, you know, really do lean into the any build can do any role kind of thing. I think this is a great time to promote looking for heals on Steam. Everyone go play that. Best game for being healers. It's out there. Uh, Cave Geek says we should swap Shadowrun stories tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, I've only... I've only played a little bit of Shadowrun, but it was all extremely memorable. And I uh, certainly, back when we were doing the World of Darkness games, back uh, when they first launched, uh, the Suffering Fossil was extremely influential upon what we were doing. But with that said, we're going to go on to our next presentation on game storytelling and game narrative design. Thank you very much, Ben. Another excellent presentation. And yeah, we got to schedule that two-hour workshop. Okay, everybody, hang tight. Thank you, Ben. All right, thanks for having me.